Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'd like to present part two of my series on the gross pathology of the GI system. Today we're going to talk about the tongue, but before we do that, as I like to start all of my lectures out, I will acknowledge my colleagues and friends who provided images either to me directly or through large online image collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start with lesions and non-lesions of young animals. Here is the underside of the tongue of a pig, and you notice these sort of vegetative, occasionally hyperkeratotic papillae on the edge of the tongue. And these are normal lingual papillae seen in a number of uh, young animals. Uh, before they start eating roughage um, or hard food, you'll see a fair amount of hyperkeratosis um, as a normal finding, and these lingual papilla, which eventually get worn off over the course of the animal's life. There is often a thick layer of hyperkeratosis on newborn animals, as we see in this full. Um, this is sort of a diffuse coating, so I tend to think that it is normal for this animal, but remember that very young immunosuppressed animals and animals that have been on antibiotics may develop thrush. And they will have also a thick layer of hyperkeratotic plaque, which contains the yeast and pseudohyphal forms of this particular fungal agent. You may also see candida in concert with animals that are concurrently suffering from salmonellosis. The tongue of this animal has large defects in the epithelial covering. And this is seen in a condition known as epitheliogenesis imperfecta, um, not as often photographed as the lesions that are seen on the leg. Epitheliogenesis imperfecta is a defect in the production of laminin-5, which is an integral component of the hemidesmosome. The feature of the skin which anchors the epidermis or mucosal lining, if we're talking about the GI tract, to the underlying dermis at the basement membrane. And when that's defective, any type of friction will separate the epithelium from the underlying submucosa or dermis. Uh, very commonly, animals will lose, lo lose large patches of skin during the birth process. And you can also see defects in the tongue because before the animal is born, it does have sucking motions, and this will rub very easily the, uh, the mucosa right off the tongue because of the defect in the hemidesmosome. A common incidental finding, often in the dog, is the presence of ectopic hairs, which are growing often in a sulcus down the middle of the tongue once considered to result from the implantation of hair shafts secondary to uh, an animal cleaning itself, these uh, uh, findings are now considered chorostomas, which is normal tissue in an abnormal location. Usually they're found on the dorsal surface, usually in a single longitudinal stripe down the middle of the tongue. There may be some associated inflammation corresponding to uh, or, or gravitating toward these hair follicles. In young animals with white muscle disease due to vitamin E or selenium imbalances in the diet or the environment or both, don't forget to check the tongue, which is one of the most commonly used and often most mobile muscles in the young animal's body, the muscles of deglutition will be some of the ones that are most commonly affected and are much easier to find these lesions that you might then searching through all the skeletal muscles of the body. And this line of white represents necrosis and loss of skeletal muscle fibers of the tongue resulting in mineralization. And it may have a gritty feel as you cut it. The tongue often has a fair amount of fat scattered throughout it, so look carefully. Don't make the mistake of a normal tongue being interpreted as one with skeletal muscle loss and mineralization. 
We can move into some of the viral diseases that affect the tongue. And this is an older picture of white spots on the top of the tongue and often the oral cavity of a macaque. Um, these spots are pathognomonic. Unfortunately, they're only seen in about 40% of cases for measles infection in uh, uh, non-human primates and in people. If you biopsy them, biopsy them, you may see multinucleate syncytial cells, which are characteristic of the morbillivirus, virus, which causes measles. As we discussed before in the previous lecture on the oral mucosa, ulceration of the tongue may represent a number of viral diseases in cattle, which all need to be investigated. At the top of my list for viral uh, induced tongue ulceration would be mucosal disease. Mucosal disease is caused by bovine pestivirus on a very characteristic fashion in which the developing fetus between the uh, ages of uh, 125 days uh, is introduced to a non-cytopathogenic uh, bovine pestivirus and learns to recognize that pestivirus as self. If it's infected earlier than that, 50 to 100 days usually results in fetal death or abortion. Between 100 to 125, uh, you'll get a number of congenital defects. And after that, if, if the animal's infected uh, up to about eh, 185 days, you have a chance of priming the animal for subsequent reinfection uh, within the first two years of life by a cytopathogenic form, which causes ulceration throughout the GI tract, uh, throughout the skin, and uh, results in the condition known as mucosal disease. Mucosal disease is caused by the infection of macrophages and lymphocytes which circulate this uh, virus to the mesenchymal tissues of the body from which it can infect basal epithelium of both the skin and the tongue resulting in necrosis and sloughing of the entire layer of skin or mucosa covering that site. There are many other changes in the body including lymphoid necrosis, uh, widespread vasculitis, um, to go along with these findings. And of course, ulceration basically throughout the animal's body. Your rule outs for this particular disease would be rinderpest, in which the uh, ulceration often stops at the four stomachs and then carries on after the four stomachs, but is usually associated with uh, respiratory signs as well. Being a morbillivirus, virus, it likes to also go after the lungs and uh, upper respiratory systems. So the animals will have rhinitis, respiratory signs as well. Of course, rinderpest has been eradicated, but testing for it still needs to be conducted. Here's a more severe case resulting in almost total loss of, uh, of mucosa from the anterior portion of the tongue in this animal with mucosal disease. And you will see these ulcers continue all the way down through the GI tract in just about every part. Um, the lesion itself is more severe in areas with a large amount of friction. You'll see it uh, longitudinally causing ulcers in the colon due to tenesmus in these animals with profound uh, diarrhea. So uh, um, over time, ulcers get worse, and they are worse in areas of friction. This is also seen in certain areas of the skin, uh, including the areas between the claws. When the animal walks, you have friction there. The animal's uh, perineum um, and, and other areas which are often associated with friction. If you looked at this particular lesion, you said, oh, I think that that may be uh, mucosal disease. Grossly, I could not argue with you. You might even consider this to be one of the vesicular diseases that we see in cattle, which we'll talk about a little later on, and, and that would certainly be a good rule out. But just to remind you, this is ulceration in the mouth due to malignant catarrhal fever. It's a different pathogenesis in which these lesions are infarctive in nature. Uh, malignant catarrhal fever is caused by a number of gamma herpes viruses, which are lymphoproliferative, and result in a uh, lymphocytic vasculitis damage to the vessels, 
ischemia and necrosis of the overlying epidermis. There's no spread of the virus to the uh, epidermal cells themselves. It's all an infarctive lesion, but can look very much like mucosal disease. While we're on the subject, let's talk about the vesicular diseases in cattle uh, and other uh, production animals, pigs, and, uh, and horses. So this, was, this would be an excellent lecture in itself. Um, and I don't know if I'm qualified to give it. Somebody like Corey Brown would do a fantastic job. But things to remember about, uh, about vesicular diseases. We get very concerned about vesicular disease because of one disease, and that's foot and mouth disease. Um, we've been lucky to keep it out of this country. It's considered a foreign animal disease, but there are parts of the world where foot and mouth disease is, is still a, uh, a real problem. Foot and mouth disease doesn't kill any animals. Uh, it may result in vesicles in the mouth, which become very large. Uh, foot and mouth disease of all the vesicular diseases tends to have the largest vesicles, which eventually will turn into degloving injuries as large parts of the mucosa tend to, tend to slough off. This disease doesn't kill any animals, but uh, it makes it very difficult for them to eat. They lose weight, and they uh, drool and smack, and raising cattle is all about making meat off of you know, uh, turning, turning food into meat or turning food into milk and animals that are not eating are not producing anything. And because of the highly communicable nature of this particular condition, um, you have tremendous economic losses and it's often cheaper just to slaughter animals than it is to ride out the outbreak. We saw this back in the mid nineties uh, with an outbreak in the United Kingdom. Uh, in parts of the world, there's always a low level uh, incidence of this disease, but once it gets into naive animals, it becomes a real problem. Cattle are the sentinel animals for this disease. They develop the lesions that are the worst and uh, are the easiest to identify um, as potentially having this condition. Uh, sheep and goats, unfortunately, do not develop very good lesions. They may have a small blister on a lip or on the coronary band, which will be totally overlooked and they will seem totally inapparent. And the nature of sheep and goat owners to drive their herds from here and there, throw them in the back of a truck and move them around, is often a major amplifier. The amplifier host for foot and mouth disease is the pig, which can take a couple of virus particles and generate thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And because this virus can spread on aerosols over many miles, it can be a real problem. So we do keep an eye out for this and essentially all vesicular diseases and all these species must be investigated very carefully to ensure that we are not dealing with foot and mouth disease. So foot and mouth disease you look for the really big vesicles. Here is a, a picture from Jeff Saunders on a pig with an ulcer on the underside of the tongue. This happened to be vesicular stomatitis but obviously we're very concerned. There is you know, vesicular stomatitis in the U.S. Uh, is seen down in the southeast um, and the southwest. We have periodic outbreaks in horses, um, which are generally fairly easily contained. There's five different vesicular diseases in pigs. They are susceptible to all of the vesicular diseases, including the rhabdovirus that causes, uh, that causes vesicular stomatitis, the Clesi virus that causes uh, vesicular exanthema, a coronavirus causing swine's vesicular disease uh, and the aptovirus that causes foot and mouth disease and now there is a new virus which causes vesicles in the mouth called Seneca Valley virus disease which are all potential rule outs for the devastating foot and mouth disease. The tongue occasionally is a site for pox viral infections. Um, pox can be a very severe disease in a number of species. Uh, I tend to think of sheep and goats and camels as getting, and humans as getting some of the worst cases, potentially fatal cases of pox. Uh, pox is a DNA virus which affects epithelium. So pox lesions are generally elevated due to the proliferation of, of the epithelium caused by the virus who wants 
more uh, targets to infect. And then the older parts of these lesions generally tend to be cavitated or necrotic, and just a, a, a picture of the underside of the tongue in a case of rabbit pox. Another virus that very commonly affects the oral cavity that we saw in a previous lecture and that you can uh, occasionally find on the tongue of a number of animal species is papillomavirus. Okay, and this is, this is papillomavirus on the underside of the tongue of a lion. Cats can get papillomavirus. Usually it takes a little bit of traumatic inoculation. And these are generally uh, uh, present in the environment where animals of a certain species are congregated. If you want a nice papillomavirus infection, um, don't wear your shower shoes at the local gym. You'll be exposed to a lot of human papillomaviruses on the floor. You may end up with a nice case of plantar warts. Same thing pretty much happens with other species, and occasionally these viruses will jump species, um, such as what we see with bovine papillomavirus 1 or 2, which cause sarcoids in horses. But they're usually fairly uh, species-specific. Here's the underside of a rabbit tongue. And you don't want to confuse this with rabbit pox virus, because papillomaviruses are usually self-limiting. Uh, the animals will develop a lymphoid response, and eventually humor response, including IgG, which prevents reinfection. Uh, histologically, you will see variably sized fronds of epithelium, and if you're lucky, you will see the coilocytes, which are very enlarged epithelial cells with uh, a grayish cast due to tremendous numbers of keratin uh, intermediate filaments within the cytoplasm, and uh, they will jump out at you that this is a viral-induced disease. Just one more, uh, uh, one more picture. This is a chimpanzee. They also get their uh, own papilloma virus, um, and this is sort of related to the human, herp uh, the human papillomavirus 13. Papillomaviruses, usually you'll see uh, hyperplasia at all levels of the, uh, of the epithelium, um, but viral production occurs usually in the stratum spinosum and stratum granulosum, and that's the best place to look for viral inclusions. Let's hit one more virus um, of the tongue, and this is seen in cats. A Khaleesi viral infection in cats is a, a uh, not uncommon finding. Up to 100% of animals in shelters will be infected with Khaleesi virus and often will be shedding Khaleesi virus um, during their stay there in periods of stress. Most cases of Khaleesi virus are fairly benign. It can be a, uh, a causative agent in respiratory infections as well and cause lesions all the way down into the lungs where it will cause a diffuse interstitial pneumonia. The most common presentation of Khaleesi virus is uh, ulcers on the tongue. It's often recovered in animals with chronic stomatitis. Um, it does cause cytolytic uh, uh, destruction of cells in a centripetal fashion, resulting initially in these vesicles, often at the edges of the tongue, which are very difficult to get in the vesicular stage. Um, much more commonly, what you will see is coalescing ulcers and ulceration of the tongue. You can also see these lesions on the hard palate as well. And if you want to culture it, the palatine tonsil is a great place to culture it from. Get them quick. These lesions tend to heal in, in 10 to 12 days. If it gets into the respiratory tract, you'll see respiratory disease with a, a necrotizing bronchitis and an interstitial pneumonia. And it often is masked by signs of concurrent infection with feline herpes virus type 1. The location of these ulcers may suggest uremia, but this condition is usually seen in young cats, not older cats with failing kidneys. Okay, let's look at uh, some bacterial infections of the tongue. Here is an animal with a large focus of necrohemorrhagic 
rhabdomyositis of the tongue and the muscles of, of deglutition. It's very dark. There's a lot of hemorrhage. And if you look closely, you can see areas of emphysema. Remember that black leg or Clostridium chauvii um, is a condition in which the bacteria are prepositioned. So any type of ischemia will result in proliferation of these, the spores, proliferation of the bacilli, and necrosis of these tissue. So it's not always seen in skeletal muscle, large muscles of the hindquarters. Always remember you can see it in the tongue, uh, as well as the heart muscle itself. A classic disease of cattle is a disease which is known as wooden tongue. This is caused by a higher bacterium known as Actinobacillus lignorisi. It's part of the normal oral flora of cattle. And it usually is a lymphangitis. While lesions may be seen at the base of the tongue, you can see this large granuloma with extensive loss of muscle and fibrosis. Um, it will spread as a lymphangitis. And if you look at the regional lymph nodes, so the pharyngeal lymph nodes, the submandibular lymph nodes, you'll also find inflammation there as well. We tend to think of it as a disease primary of cattle um, and the tongue, but it might go down into the wall of the four stomachs. You may see it in the uh, skin. And some of this may break off and start infections in the lungs as well. Um, also seen in pigs and dogs, and believe it or not, chickens. And here's an absolutely gorgeous cross-section of the tongue of an affected animal where you can see there is extensive fibrosis, but scattered throughout the uh, fibrous connective tissue, you can see these yellow-orange foci of granulomatous inflammation. As we talk about bacterial diseases of the tongue, let's not forget about especially in ruminants, our good friend Fusobacterium necrophorum, a common commensal of the oral and respiratory cavity uh, in the GI tract of cattle. It's always around, always looking for a way to get deep into tissue, set up an anaerobic condition, and go to town. And here's one underneath the tongue. Chances are this animal was eating some food or, and poked itself with a wire or a stick, just enough to inoculate Fusobacterium into the sublingual soft tissue, and here we go. If I'm looking at lesions of the tongue and it's a young animal, I'm going to think about Fusobacterium necrophorum. These lesions are often called necro. Um, and in an older animal, I'll probably think about Actinobacillus lignorisi. Younger calves often have lesions in the mouth. Older calves, especially those in the feedlot, will have lesions in the larynx, referred to as necrotic laryngitis as a result of uh, coughing, and very classic bilaterally symmetrical uh, necrotizing lesions uh, in the areas of the vocal folds and the medial aspect of the arytenoidus muscles. Um, Fused bacterium, you can see anywhere. You can see it as abscesses in the liver found uh, as a result of uh, uh, ruminal acidosis. And because it is a commensal in the GI tract, it's commonly found in uh, feces, and it's often a primary cause in uh, various types of foot rot and hoof infections. Here's an unusual spot for, for a... Uh, a disease of protozoans, and these nodules on the tongue are caused by leishmania. Leishmania is an emerging disease in many parts of the world, South America and uh, uh, Southern Europe, and you'll see a lot of animals which are infected with leishmania, and you can see it in just about any organ. These nodules, if you took a histologic section, would be full of macrophages containing the amastigotes and surrounded by the very characteristic plasmacytic inflammation, which is associated with, uh, with leishmaniasis. Uh, many cutaneous forms will have extensive inflammation and crusting of the skin, but this is just a great picture of the tongue lesions 
that you might see. Not a classic gross lesion, but something that you may want to be aware of. Another fungal infection of the tongue in pigs is candidiasis. Candida albicans is a normal inhabitant of the GI tract. And superficial mucosal infections have been identified in foals, as we have previously talked about, have been seen in pigs, and occasionally are seen in birds as well, affecting the, uh, the upper GI tract. They're often associated with immunosuppression, antibiotic administration, and uh, in pigs, it can also be seen in the skin or as part of a systemic infection as well. Here's an older picture showing multiple cystocerci within the uh, skeletal muscle of the tongue. These are the uh, cystocerci of cystocercus bovis, which is a, a larval form of the human tapeworm Tinea saginata. Uh, humans are the uh, primary host. Bovines are the immediate host. Seems a fairly obvious life cycle. And uh, when humans pass the hexacanth embryos, they penetrate the intestine, and they tend to go to the various very active muscles uh, of the cattle, which tend to include the muscles of the uh, oral cavity, the tongue, and the muscles of the jaws, which are going uh, at a slightly higher metabolic rate uh, and level of activity than many of the other skeletal muscles. You can also find them in the heart as well. Another AP complex and parasite, uh, we see these white parasitic cysts, which represent uh, probably mesenchymal tissues. And fibroblasts are seen throughout the body in this possum, and this is uh, besnoidea. Besnoidea is a, a AP complex in which parasitize a wide range of uh, animal species. Besnoidea darlingi is the one that affects possums, but Besnoidea, Besnoidea affects cattle. Besnoidea uh, tarandi affects reindeer and elk. And there are a number of other ones that uh, infection uh, usually occurs in mesenchymal tissues throughout the body. It, doesn't seem, it seems to be tolerated very well by possums. It does not cause the economic issues that we see in cattle which develop a, a severe dermatitis, conjunctivitis, and lesions in multiple organs, including the testes, which can ruin a good bull because of elevation of the temperature, inflammation, and uh, subsequent loss of fertility. Here's an extremely cool parasite of fish, if, uh, especially if you like horror movies. This is a, a small crustacean um, known as Cymothoa exigua. Here's two of them here. Uh, also known as the tongue-eating louse. Uh, this particular parasite attaches to the tongue of a fish and occasionally to the gill arches and extracts blood through the claws on its front feet, eventually resulting in atrophy of the tongue and the animal then attaches to the muscles at the base of the tongue and stays right there where the tongue used to be so it is first up whenever the animal gets ready to take a meal. Cymothoa exigua. Okay, leaving some of the infectious disease. Other important diseases that we see in cats. Here's a lesion on the underside of the tongue. It's sort of a papillary lesion. Uh, somewhat ulcerative, non-invasive, and the underside tongue is a great place for granulation tissue to form in uh, dogs and cats. Uh, we get a lot of submissions, especially from dentists, um, from this site, and they're looking for cancer, squamous cell carcinoma, maybe eosinophilic granuloma, and uh, what, they, what we often see is just granulation tissue. The animal has somehow scarified that mucosa, and because the, it is constantly wet, the tongue is constantly in motion. You have a lot of granulation tissue formation without the ability. It comes in much faster 
then the a, a animal can regenerate the mucosal epithelium over it. It's a little bit like the formation of proud flesh in, at the, on the feet of horses. Lots of motion, not, and uh, sort of wetness. They do have much better vascularity there than uh, horses do um, on the uh, distal part of their limbs, but they do get these large floor proliferations of granulation tissue. Another possibility for this particular lesion would be an eosinophilic granuloma. Um, eosinophilic granulomas are members of that family, uh, which include uh, uh, rodent ulcers. Um, they tend to pop up anywhere in the oral cavity, and they're not only ulcerative, they may also be very proliferative. So a biopsy of this in the early stages should show a lot of eosinophilic inflammation, but remember, over time, the eosinophils will go away, it'll be a, become an area of just chronic inflammation, and the population will change more to lymphocytes and plasma cells. So if you have an eosinophilic granuloma that's been around for a long time, your biopsy is not gonna be reflective of the name. Now, eosinophilic granulomas are not only the province of cats. We do occasionally see them in dogs, especially uh, sled dogs, huskies, uh, uh, malamutes. They tend to develop eosinophilic granulomas of the tongue and the oral cavity. They usually affect the tongue, and they look sort of like a linear granuloma in the cat. There's a lot of histiocytic inflammation, but enough eosinophils to give it sort of a greenish appearance. And collagen degradation is a very characteristic feature of the biopsy of this condition. Um, you can also see them as shallow ulcers of the, uh, the palate. And on cytology, you want to differentiate these from lingual mast cell tumors. Uh, mast cell tumors do occasionally pop up in the oral cavity, especially uh, the tongue can be associated with a lot of eosinophils. So think about what kind of animal, a malamute, a husky, I'm going to be thinking of eosinophilic granuloma, possibly. Okay, we have bilaterally symmetrical ulcers on the underside of the tongue. And whenever we see bilaterally symmetric lesions, I want you to think about the possibility of either toxic, metabolic, or nutritional disease. Viral infections don't do them. Bacterial infections don't do them. It's usually the province of metabolic aberration or toxic disease. And a classic cause for ulcers on the underside of the tongue is chronic renal failure. Now, there are two types of lesions that you get from renal failure. One is this ulceration, and the second one is infarction usually at the tip of the tongue. They both result from high levels of uh, uremia or BUN, high, uremia, high levels of, of circulating urea nitrogen. In this particular case, the urea nitrogen, when it hits a specific level, sort of exudes out through the oral mucosa into the saliva. And these animals are in advanced renal failure. They generally have breath that smells of ammonia. And what happens is that saliva concentrates this alkaline urea. And essentially, the, uh, the saliva becomes a ammonia bath, a very high pH caustic environment in which the tongue is laying. So the ulcers in these animals are generally on the underside of the tongue because that tongue is in a constant alkali bath. The infarct is also due to high levels of, of urea nitrogen because urea nitrogen in very high levels will cause uh, damage to endothelium and thrombosis of vessels, especially throughout the GI tract. And you can see ulcerations in the, uh, uh, in the stomach. Um, you can see ulcerations in the GI tract, but not uncommonly. You will see thrombosis at the distal edge of the tongue. These are end arteries and damage to the, uh, uh, to the endothelium will result in thrombosis and there's very poor collateral circulation at the tip of the tongue. This animal, if it survives, and they rarely do because they are, are in chronic renal failure, may actually even slough the end of the tongue and have a foreshortened tongue. But uh, 
look for thrombosis of the tongue in animals in chronic renal failure. Other toxic causes of ulceration in the tongue in this horse would be uh, elevated uh, levels or excessive uh, butazolidin administration or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. You're going to see ulcerations throughout the GI tract. Um, you'll see it in the stomach, pylorus, pretty much up and down in some severe cases, um, very commonly in the right dorsal colon. So this is an area, especially in foals, where you can get lingual ulcers by someone who has been aggressively using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Another toxic lesion which affects the tongue causes paralysis, and this is botulism. Uh, botulism uh, causes paralysis of, of the tongue due to uh, uh, botulinum toxin. The tongue is skeletal muscle like everything else in these animals. Go through a progression of first going into sternal recumbency, then resting their head on the ground, then uh, you'll start to see paralysis of the tongue as the animal is progressively affected with this toxin ultimately, which will end up with an inability to breathe. Another historical uh, toxin which causes hyperkeratosis of the tongue is that of chlorinated naphthalene. We don't see that much anymore. It was extremely popular during World War II and made an excellent lubricant. Uh, after that, in the 50s and 60s, it was a common ingredient in dry cleaning solution, but because of its predilection, especially when, when cattle got into it to cause severe hyperkeratosis, wart-like growths appearing in the mouths, and severe hyperkeratosis of the skin, um, it has been phased out. And the same thing will happen in humans. It has been phased out and uh, rarely will you encounter chlorinated naphthalene. The, the cause or the name of the disease um, was X disease. Not ecstasy, but X as in the, the letter X disease. And you would see it in cattle that got into some of these chemicals, some of these lubricants. Even uh, feed that was pelleted in a machine lubricated with this grease was, uh, was identified as potential causes for chlorinated naphthalene toxicosis. Well, we're just about done. We always cover the tumors at the end, and this is a cat. It could be a small cat. It could be a big cat like a lion, but whenever we see an ulcerated uh, lesion uh, underneath the tongue, one would think about squamous cell carcinoma, the number one cause of death in old cats now that we vaccinate routinely for feline leukemia is squamous cell carcinoma. These are very infiltrative lesions, um, difficult to surgically excise, tend to penetrate down into and around the jaws. Eventually the animal will probably suffer not only severe halitosis but difficulty eating, but eventually may result in a pathologic fracture. They occasionally will metastasize uh, local to local lymph nodes, very rarely to the lungs, but uh, they tend to be a, uh, uh, a tragic situation for these older beloved and affected animals. There have been papers that have associated it with uh, smoking. Um, I had a mother-in-law who smoked like a chimney and had two cats and they both died of squamous cell carcinoma, but that also meant that they lived long, happy lives because this is really a disease that is most often seen in the aged cat. My last picture is from Dr. Fabrizio Grandi um, showing some large nodules on the tongue here, and this is a case of T-cell epitheliotropic lymphoma. You can see it anywhere in the GI tract. The uh, sort of bizarre looking T-cells will invade the mucosa of the GI tract, uh, resulting in what's known as Pautrier's microabscesses and these reddened uh, hyperemic nodules. Not a difficult uh, diagnosis to make. Usually you can make a very good one on H&E and then throw a, a T-cell marker and a very cheap and easy positive diagnosis to make. Well, it's almost 40 minutes on the tongue. I hope you've hung in there and I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, we're going to come back in Lecture 3, talk about the teeth and the diseases affecting the bones of the oral cavity. I look forward to uh, teaching that one to you in a day or so. Thank you so much for 
attending and have a great day.